Hello, and welcome to Our Future in Space. My name is Dr. Jeff Greenblatt. I'm the Vice President for Science and Research at Orbital Assembly Corporation. In this podcast, we explore the technical, economic, social, political, and ethical considerations of moving humanity off the planet and into the solar system. We now have the ability to sustain humans uh, in low Earth orbit and soon throughout the solar system. Do we stay on, on the Earth or and merely survive or move out into the solar system and thrive? I'm joined today by my co-host, Eric Ward, the Vice President for Engineering Design at OAC. How are you doing, Eric? I'm doing pretty well. Uh, this is going to be an interesting one. We have a bit of a different episode today. A uh, uh, short while ago, we did some short interviews with a couple of our partners uh, at Orbital Assembly Corporation, and we thought we'd put some of those together and release it for our viewers. So uh, we'll be hearing some short interviews uh, today, one from Dr. Angie Buckley and another from Jeff Greeson. So I hope you guys enjoy the little bit of a change this week. Well, we've got Dr. Angie Buckley here. She's a principal engineer in the Center for Space Policy and Strategy Defense Systems Group at the Aerospace Corporation and an instructor for Aerospace University. Her professional experience spans a broad range of defense and space systems research, analysis, design, and technical management. Thanks for coming, Angie. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. So yeah, how did you, yeah, how'd you become interested in artificial gravity research in the first place? Um, well, some years ago, uh, when uh, uh, Gilles Clement and I were at the International Space University, we were working together, and um, I, he needed some uh, technical backup. We've been, he's been studying artificial gravity for a long time, and I've jumped in since like the late uh, late aughts, I guess. Well, actually, before that, the mid aughts, and. Uh, I get very interested from the technical analysis standpoint. And so I've been sort of the technical uh, analyst behind all of this, but in the process, I've learned a lot about artificial gravity, the benefits of having artificial gravity, um, and the benefits of doing studies uh, in that environment. Uh, and especially in an environment where you can generate variable gravity levels. Uh, so this has just been something that I've been really interested in since the concept was introduced to me, and I, I, I've uh, tried to stay active in it ever since. Great. Yeah, no, we're so excited to be able to talk to you about this as one of the uh, you know leading experts on this topic. It's a pretty small community, as I understand, right, of artificial gravity researchers? Yeah, it, it's pretty small, yeah. We have a lot of people who enjoy doing parabolic flight missions to do microgravity type research. And of course, uh, there's lots of opportunities on the International Space Station to do microgravity research if you can get you know, your experiment accepted by NASA uh, to fly. Mm -hmm. But there hasn't been a whole lot of work done on uh, partial gravity. And it is possible to fly like a lunar gravity parabolic flight and a Martian gravity parabolic flight. So some work has been done in lunar and Martian gravity and trying to understand physiological responses and, and also, um, you know, physical sciences kinds of things, you know. How do, how do these uh, different uh, manufacturing techniques, how might those work? say, in a lunar gravity environment, which which could be very important to us uh, in the not-so-distant future. Absolutely. That's right. And so the partial gravity... But there's gravity, a limitation. I was just going to yeah. say, but there's a limitation in doing parabolic flights at these gravity levels, right, or any parabolic flight, because, what, you're limited to about 30 seconds at a time between um, cycles? I, yeah, actually, for a zero-g parabola, it's about 22 seconds. Of, uh, of microgravity. For the lunar uh, gravity level, I think that stretches it out to just better than half a minute. But then when okay. you do the Martian gravity, yeah, that's a, a much more, it's a, it's, it's a longer trajectory. So you actually end up with about 45 seconds of uh, oh, Martian gravity. And, and that's been really useful like I said, for you know some experiments that the few experiments that have been done in those uh, those partial gravity environments, and in fact, next summer there'll be a partial gravity flight that there will be no 
microgravity, but we'll, we'll do 0.25G, 0.5G, and then 0.75G. Because yeah. one of the things that we don't understand is what is the minimum level of artificial gravity that humans might need to carry on and function uh, adequately. And that's one of the concerns about when people go to Mars all that time in microgravity, you know, you, you see how people come off the space station and they need, they need help moving around. We do not need that for our astronauts when they go uh, to Mars. It's not so big a deal on the moon because it's pretty close. It's a short trip. But, mm -hmm. but still, we need to understand, you know, is 0.16G on the moon enough for humans to actually think about, you know, uh, putting an outpost there and staying there for some mm -hmm. of the time? Sure. Yeah, no, that it totally makes sense. I mean, given where our, our ambitions for human uh, exploration are going. Um, right. And and I understand that scientists are very clever at designing experiments that can learn a lot in 30 to 45 seconds. But <laughs> yeah. wouldn't it be nice if we could have a continuous environment, right? And It, it so, would indeed be nice if we could have a continuous environment. And uh, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I think that would be a, a really interesting thing to do because then we could do incremental steps, you know, uninterrupted uh, and, and kind of find that threshold where, okay, if we've got 0.3G, we're good or, or whatever the number is. I have no idea what the number might be. So uh, that, that, will, that is definitely of interest. Yeah, we were talking with Shauna Pandya a while ago, and she she talked a lot about that dosimetry of gravity, right? And you know all the various conditions that microgravity might might you know create, right? Like you mentioned, post flight or orthostatic syndrome, but there's also the space flight neuroocular space flight adjusted neuroocular syndrome sands. I might have misadjusted, mm -hmm. and you know of course bone loss and muscle muscle density loss is a is a big one, and some other conditions and she was mentioning that the dosimetry, right, for artificial gravity might even be different for each of those physiological responses. Mm -hmm. Right. And that, that's, that's why it's, it's important to know that threshold because mm -hmm. we're looking at a, you know, a, a, a kind of a, a, not trying to say global, but, you know, just kind of a single solution to address um, all of those mm -hmm. issues that arise when you're in microgravity. Uh, I mean, this this could be. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of the name. Well, I'll, it'll come back to me. But uh, yeah. yeah, but this this might be uh, a good strategy for helping to alleviate that. And in fact, mm -hmm. even if the uh, if astronauts on the way to Mars just had access to a short arm centrifuge, uh, there might mm -hmm. be enough enough um, uh, artificial gravity created in that way. You know, to keep them uh, fit enough that when they land, they they can just uh, get out and not have the issues that we see folks have when they come back from the ISS. Right, but until we've done those experiments for an extended period of time, uh, it sounds like, and we've never had that capability on the International Space mm -hmm. Station. Even a mm -hmm. short arm centrifuge is too 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 big or too short arm. Yeah. Oh, it, right. it was too supposed to. They, they were going to have one, but it got it got canceled. At some mm -hmm. point, right. it, it, it was planned to have that. Uh, there have been short arm centrifuges flown uh, on the shuttle, for example, mm -hmm. uh, and some really interesting data came mm -hmm. out of that. Uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, yeah. whatever we so, can do to to learn more about those mm -hmm. thresholds and and actually provide an environment on orbit where people can move around and not be sick. Of course, that means you've got to get the spin rate right and the radius right, mm -hmm. so that you not in, so that you're in that sweet spot, uh, so people don't get sick. But um, you know, uh, I think it'd be really interesting, and I think it would open the aperture for a lot more experimentation, a lot of different kinds of experiments that could be done on orbit uh, to better understand our physiology. You know, what do we need to help plants grow? You know, uh, mm -hmm. if we're gonna if we're gonna grow plants in space or food sources, you know, what environment will they thrive in? So, it, it's all important. In other words, if we 
if we have a choice between zero gravity or something more than that, plants might do better or certain species of plants might do a lot better, uh, at least with some gravity to orient. Potentially, yeah. yeah. Uh, what, what we see in microgravity is that, you know, plants kind of just grow in every direction. And, and actually, they get a little yeah. bit bigger. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, uh, no, interesting. but right. um, you know, it it might be uh, a little less challenging if you could, you know, have some level of gravity and, you know, you could, you could do experiments to see where the yields uh, are optimized. So uh, all sorts of things sure. to think about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. But let me maybe ask you one question about commercial applications. I mean, this is, a, you know, basic research obviously is going to be very important for our fundamental understanding, which will then lead to how we can better do both, um, you know, knowledge-based as well as commercial uh, human missions in the future to various places, right? Moon, Mars, mm -hmm. just deep space. Do you see having an artificial gravity station also as an enabler of, you know, this commercial space ecosystem? Like how else could having that capability be, be useful for uh, some of the things we want to do? Well, there's a, a you know, a, a strong interest, uh, at least on the part of NASA, uh, to capitalize on the uh, commercial LEO. In fact, they've stood up uh, an office of commercial uh, low Earth orbiting um, activities to promote just that, to see what can be done. And I think providing a, a platform uh, wherein you could have, uh, you know, you could vary the gravity for one thing, but in the center, you're still going to have that microgravity environment. So if you wanted, you know, people to work more comfortably in a, a, a some gravity level, you, you still have the possibilities of doing things in microgravity. So I think that would facilitate doing different types of study, looking at different gravitational regi regimes just right there. So that's an advantage. Also, manufacturing, uh, you know, 3D printers like to have a little bit of gravity. Uh, but we also know that, you know, um, uh, things like protein crystals and some other materials, uh, especially like Z-Bland glass, uh, when you manufacture that in a, zero, in a microgravity environment, it comes out m with many, many, many fewer of those little crystals that would uh, prevent the, uh, the optical communications from happening. Right. So there, there are tons of... And, and there are things that we haven't even discovered yet, you know, mm -hmm. and, and having having this type of platform where you could have scientists, you know, long term in, a, in an environment that would sustain them. And you don't have to worry about the microgravity effects, but also have access to a microgravity environment in the same you know type of mm -hmm. uh, vehicle. You know, that's that would be really awesome in terms of, you know, gravitation or in terms of doing experiments, you know, in, in both environments. And the fact that you could vary, I assume that you would have a variable rotation rate so that you could vary the G levels even better. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about a little bit about what OAC is planning. You know, the Pioneer Station mm -hmm. that we are uh, on schedule to be uh, building and launching in a few years' time has exactly that. It has a variable uh, spin rate capability so that you can vary the gravity across the whole station. And there is, because you have some, um, you know, some depth in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the, the modules that would house either humans or experiment at various distances from the center of rotation, you can have a gravity gradient even within the same, uh, within the same chamber. And right. so you can take advantage of those, of those differences as well. Um, right, great. That, that's really interesting. It's, it's interesting that someone has is, is picked up on this and started thinking about it. There are, you know, uh, at least three other commercial space stations mm -hmm. that are in planning. I think it's Axiom, uh, Star Lab, and um, uh, oh, uh, Orbital Reef. Uh, but I, I don't have any information with regard to what type of facilities they might have to generate. Uh, an artificial gravity environment if they're even planning for that. So um, yeah. I think there's room for, for, for all of these things mm -hmm. in terms of supporting research, uh, uh, particularly in exploration, and also research that will in turn potentially yield something quite useful uh, for all of humanity for here on the Earth. Mm -hmm. So always thinking broadly about things like yes. that. Yes, mm -hmm. great. <laughs> 
Yeah, that excites me too, is that, you know, as we as we grow these different capabilities, especially in space, you know, we're going to learn things that we didn't know that there were to learn. And mm -hmm. the implications of right. that will impact, you know, all of hum human life, you know, even even that, you know, part of our, us that stays on the planet. So yeah. I'm excited to figure out what we're going to learn too, in addition to actually <laughs> learning, of course. <laughs> me too. I yeah. wish that we could better educate, uh, you know, everybody about how they use space every day and they don't even know it. Okay. You know, bank transactions, GPS, uh, agriculture, mm -hmm. I mean, you just land use in general. It's, uh, I mean, it's an yeah. amazing set of tools that we've developed. And, uh, yeah. So, oh, yes. And it's, there's more coming because, like you say, you know, not even understanding how the, uh, you know, just talking about gravity again, how a partial gravity environment might be beneficial for certain kinds of research or manufacturing capabilities. It might become an essential tool. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, we foresee large scale manufacturing in orbit in a few years' time because as our yeah. capabilities grow, you know, technical maturity as well as volume that brings down costs, volume of transport to and from the Earth's surface. It, it there is a path to having, you know, a significant manufacturing presence in orbit that can supplement, mm -hmm. um, you know, the Earth economy. Um, right, and, and you haven't even touched on the fact that people have long thought about and even dreamed about having hotels on orbit. And if you mm -hmm. have the capability to provide um, some kind of gravitational environment, but also an environment where people could play, you know, like in mm -hmm. microgravity, um, and a place where they could comfortably look out the windows and just just, just see the planet from, from orbit, uh, I, I think that would be a big draw. Mm -hmm. So yes. I, I don't know a lot of the details of your, you know, of your plans, but I would assume that that's somewhere back of your head, uh, back of your. Oh yes, Tour, tourism is definitely a a market segment that we are uh, identifying as being really important. But uh, we're we're focusing more on manufacturing and research for the present time, but mm -hmm. uh, we we know that that's an important component. Plus, yeah. stations such as ours can be used for. Uh, other kinds of, uh, I would say, non-research applications such as uh, uh, filmmaking, documentaries, you know, advertising, uh, things like that that use the unique environment of space and um, can and, really, and even uh, sports powerful. in space. There's yes, we haven't even <laughs> talked about the new possibilities that uh, mm -hmm. zero or partial gravity environment would provide for all kinds of yeah. Yeah, I, I heard of. Art. Yeah, Tim has this beautiful render of a basketball hoop in space. It's really tall, but he still has a little trampoline under it. And I'm thinking, you know, if, if you can turn the gravity down, you don't need the trampoline. You can still dunk a 20 foot hoop, you know, so. Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah. well, it could be an equalizer, you know, because mm -hmm. that would allow people right. uh, who might have physical challenges to mm -hmm. maybe participate in some kind of sport, whereas sure. on the ground, it, it's uh, not possible. I'm yeah, sure some people yeah, would do absolutely. that. So, but just, you know, lots lots of possibilities. This is sort of you got to use your imagination. And uh, even if the idea seems crazy today, I mean, you know, 25 years ago, we yeah, thought yeah. We, we never dreamed of this, you know. Right. So. I mean, even even the space industry in the last 10 years, you've seen so many different business models come up that we weren't even imagining, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And once you open up this sort of commercial avenue, like with CubeSats, you know, mm -hmm. clever entrepreneurs are going to have more ideas than any one of us could. And they're, you know, an entrepreneur is going to try it out and, and some of them will stick and do some really interesting, you know, very neat stuff that, you know, we could sit here brainstorming all day and, and we're not yeah. going to be able to predict some of those things. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, when Planet started and when Spire started, mm -hmm. I, I don't think they, I, I know, you know, the people involved with both of those companies. And I know that, I don't know that they ever imagined how useful the products yeah. that they're generating. And so that just makes me even more excited about having uh, a platform on orbit that could, you know, generate variable gravity environments mm -hmm. because we could do so much more. Uh, so, yeah, good. All right. <laughs> well, thanks so much for your time, Angie. This is great. Uh, really enjoy talking with you. Um, yeah, we appreciate and, uh, you coming on. Oh, it's been it's been it's been really fun. I 
I'm, I'm never at a loss of words to talk about space and, you know, this <laughs> sort of thing. <laughs> it's it's kind of my life, you know, uh, but, but it's, uh, I appreciate you inviting me to, to be on this, uh, on this program. Uh, so yeah, thank you for your time too. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank You're you. Welcome. Thank you. Bye. So that was our interview with Angie and we really appreciate her coming on uh, with us. And next up for you guys, we have an interview with Jeff Greason. I hope you enjoy it. All right. So we're joined here today with uh, uh, Jeff Grayson, who is the chairman of the Tau Zero Foundation and the co-founder of uh, Electric Sky. Um, Jeff is an entrepreneur and innovator with 25 years experience in the commercial space uh, industry. Um, at Electric Sky, he's developing long-range wireless power for propulsion, as well as other purposes. At the Tau Zero Foundation, he is working on developing advanced propulsion technologies for solar system, as well as interstellar missions. He's been active in the development of the commercial space regulation and legislation, serving on the Augustine Commission in 2009. Jeff was the co-founder of XCore Aerospace and served as CEO from 1999 until 2015. And previously, Jeff was a rocket engine team lead at Rotary Rocket and an engineering manager in chip technology development at Intel. He holds 28 US patents and has recently published papers on novel space propulsion concepts. He's also a governor of the National Space Society. Jeff, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. So I'm just gonna get right to it. Um, what attracted you to working with Orbital Assembly Corporation? Well, my interest in the space field more broadly is in the economic development and eventual human settlement off the planet Earth. And uh, you can't go very far into that field before the depths of our ignorance about what it takes to keep human beings healthy off the Earth becomes revealed. It's it's really shocking Um you know, 50 plus years or 60 plus years into the space age, how the first fundamental questions that you might ask, not only do we not have the answers to, it's not obvious anybody is working on getting them very hard. Um, and gravity is one of the two big unsolved human health hazards or lack of gravity. Um, you know, it comes up it comes up immediately when you start asking questions about, oh, okay, so we want to have a discussion about where it makes sense for economic development or human settlement to take place. Um, you immediately get into people arguing with each other about this place is better than that place or that place is better than this place. But they don't know because, you know, many things you can do something about, it's very hard to change the gravity of a planet. Uh, you know, you can you can put up a dome for atmosphere. You can set up closed life support to get your food, and, and you know you can mine materials that 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 are that are you need. And if you need are deficient in some element, you can imagine a trading network to solve that. But the gravity is the gravity. Uh, so you know, is is lunar gravity enough? That'd be really good to know. The moon is right next door. It has many advantages. Uh, if if that's enough to keep you healthy. We'd be good to know that. Is Mars gravity enough? I mean, if Mars gravity isn't enough, all of the other arguments about whether Mars is or isn't a good target for long-term human settlement kind of go out the window. And it's not just planetary surfaces. Um, you know, part of the reason why long duration space flight is important is with current propulsion technology, which I'm doing my best to do something about. Uh, but still with current propulsion technology, trips take a long time. You know, you want the crew to arrive wherever they're going healthy. Uh, there's an enormous difference in the engineering difficulty and the mass penalty to the spacecraft in whether or not you have to provide one six G of artificial gravity or a third G or a full G. Um, I mean, I, I get this, I get into arguments like this with people all the time. They're like, well, it's, it's just too hard. It's just too hard to, 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 to too much mass, too much complexity to add artificial gravity to a spacecraft. And I'm going, you don't know that. I mean, if, if, if one six G is enough, you can do, you know, what used to be called the tumbling pigeon, uh, just two, 
two habitats on the end of a boom, and that's your spacecraft, you know, and and no despun section, no docking, no 2001 big wheel, and, and just start it tumbling end over end during your voyage to Mars, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you want to do that at 16G, that's not a lot of engineering complexity. Uh, is 16G enough? Gosh, right, it'd be right. good to know. Um, and you know, those are the things that people talk about, but they what they don't talk about so much is even in your habitat design, there are real engineering challenges that are associated with doing human habitats in zero gravity just for the plumbing. Mm -hmm. You know, you you gotta you gotta make a shower work somehow. You gotta make a toilet work somehow. Um, you have fluid lines that are running around carrying things that have dissolved gases from human life support and corrosion issues. If those are um, under some kind of gravity, spin gravity, you know where the bubbles are. You know, the water, the water goes down and the bubbles go up. Uh, the space station had major problems with some of its fluid loops because of bubbles accumulating in unexpected places and contaminants concentrating at the bubble interface and corrosion setting up in the lines. And, you know, every single one of these issues has a whole discipline of people who've spent their careers learning how to live with the problem. You know, people, you know, mm -hmm. people have ideas about how to do showers that go back to Skylab. People have been struggling with how to do space toilets, you know, since the shuttle and the, the struggle continues. Uh, people have, you know, learned how to do more corrosion resistant materials so we can try to live with the fact that we don't know where the bubbles go in the fluid lines, just like on the human health side. You know, people, maybe we can make the astronauts exercise four hours a day. Well, okay, maybe that solves one problem you know, of, the, of the muscular atrophy. Does that do right, anything right. about the bone loss? No. Does that do anything about the fluid shifts into the head? No. Does that do anything about the fact that we recently discovered that there's actually stagnant flow in long duration zero gravity. The, the blood coming out of your neck doesn't always flow the right direction, which scares yeah, the yeah. pieces out of me because that's like asking for clots. And I don't understand how we've got knock out one yet. Um, and whatever it is that's going on with, with the, the ocular system, you know, that's relatively recently discovered like last 15 years uh, that, that, at many astronauts suffer sometimes quite severe degradation in their vision uh, that doesn't necessarily get better uh, after they return to gravity. And there have been many theories about what's going on with that. Um, none of them have really gathered convincing evidence in the experiments that have been done to figure out what's going on. We don't really know what's going on. We don't even have the beginnings of an idea about how to cure what's going on. Um, and I just look at all as an engineer, you know, I look at this giant collection of problems, most of which are unsolved. And I just go, God, wouldn't it be easier to just put some spin on? Yeah. <laughs> well, well, as you know, that's where the conclusion we came to, too, is why we're why we're building that. We think it's right. super important. And, and there's you know, no way to find out, you know, the, these questions about. How much G it takes to do these things? I mean, the engineering questions about how much G it takes for showers and toilets and stuff to work, we know the answers to that. And the answer is, you know, 0.05 to 0.1 G is enough to get those things going. Um, and, you know, it's not crazy to speculate that for the same reasons, that same range might be enough to start producing interesting biomedical effects of remediation of people, because people are to some extent you know, a plumbing system. And, right. and, you know, if you get to the point where the plumbing is all flowing the right way in, in your in your me mechanisms, it's not crazy to think that maybe it'll flow the right way in the people. And that would be so easy. I mean, it's, I've said this before, and I know it sounds over the top, but I really think so. I mean, it's, it's medical malpractice to keep sending astronauts to the International Space Station for long duration space flight experiments without starting to work on remediation. You know, in in right. in no other in other fields, once you have discovered that a certain thing is bad for you, you are not allowed to expose people to it just to find out how bad it is. 
<laughs> yes. I mean, that's, that's, that's I mean, a nerve technically nerve. they're volunteers, but we try to avoid uh, that as much as even if, they're, even if they're volunteers, they're not allowed to do yeah. it because yeah. the, yeah. you know, that's, it's unethical. Once you've already figured out that it's a bad thing, it's unethical to keep sending people in to just add decimal places to how bad is bad. You know, you, that, from that point forward, if you expose people to it, you do it as part of a medical trial for some kind of cure, you know, or some kind of treatment. And then you take volunteers and blah, 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 blah. You know, we're, we're continue, we, we know long duration zero gravity is bad for you. It, it's, not, it's not an ethical stance for us to continue finding out just how bad is bad without making some effort to make bad into good. Uh, and, and, you know, you look at you, you're an engineer, you know, this stuff. I mean, if it's, what if 0.05 G is enough? Mm -hmm. right? Okay. We don't know. Well, uh, that's that'd be a lot easier. Yeah. Easier to engineer a system that only spins, you know, at, <laughs> at 0.05 G equivalent. Than yeah. I mean, you're the shortest arm you could use because you've got to have room for people to stand up in it, you know, at the, <laughs> at the, at, at a speed that we're very confident would be tolerable for all of the other effects will get you right, 0.05 G. Uh, that's right. You know, so uh, it's just, it's just mind boggling to me, even as an experienced observer of the US space program, that, you know, we did exactly one artificial gravity experiment on Gemini once, mm -hmm. one time at like 0. 0.001 G. <laughs> um, it worked the first time we tried it. Um, and we've never done a thing with it since. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, we won't spend time here speculating on why that may or may not have, you know, happened. But fact is, you know, we're making a concerted effort to make this reality, make it an everyday experience of going into space. And I think you've made a good case that there are a lot of reasons medically, as well as, you know, physics, why we would like to explore that. One question I want to ask you is, have you given any thought to commercial possibilities of having the ability to, you know, perform uh, operations in fractional gravity? Are there advantages you think for manufacturing or other things, um, you know, that that would be useful? We don't know. Um, that's, that's the only honest answer you can give. I mean, we, we, we didn't predict most of the interesting things we found to do in zero gravity. And so we probably haven't successfully predicted the things to do in partial gravity. When you think about what a space manufacturing facility might be, um, most people I know who have thought about that um, envision a free flyer where you, you get very low levels of gravity and then you centrifuge within that free flyer the processes that want some degree of gravity you know, for fluid separation or for this air liquid or gas liquid separation kind of phenomena. Um, sure. But again, you know, before you were to design a facility like that, surely it would be helpful to have tried out those processes at an experimental scale and figured out what gravity level would be convenient to run them in. Uh, because there, as with the people, you know, using using more than you need needless adds needless cost and complexity um so i think that there is potentially an industrial research activity along with the biomedical research activities to be done in a variable gravity facility it's less um in the case of the industrial experiments one can imagine other ways of doing those experiments it still might be more convenient to do them in a facility that you didn't have to build in a dedicated way. Um, but it's at least plausible to imagine that if you didn't have a variable G research facility, you could think of ways to do the experiment. Um, whereas, you know, biological organisms don't scale down arbitrarily small. Uh, and, you know, people only come in certain sizes. Uh, so there really is no way to gather the necessary biomedical data without a variable G research facility of some kind. Right. What about uh, lunar or Mars analog, uh, you know, environments for testing uh, 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 mission, mission components or um, 
processes that we're planning to do on the surface of those planets, do you think that it would be useful to have such a facility, uh, you know, in Earth orbit where you can test for long periods and not just a few seconds at a time? Certainly, if you had it, you'd use it. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I got to put a caveat on that. If one hypothesizes somebody who wants to set up such a facility who is actually interested in the result rather than in getting paid for the process, then one would think that if one had it, one would want to use it. Um, right. not, the current structures for funding these things are not always optimized to do things the easy way. Yes, very true. <laughs> but other tools in the toolkit can find their uses. And sure. uh, I'm sure that there will be you know, uh, uh, applications where it's really the best way to get the, the data that you're looking for. One would think. Um, yep. So beyond uh, research, how do you see the application of OAC's technologies for uh, commercial activities? Well, um, I've always thought space tourism has potential as a market, you know, without getting too deep into the economics of space transportation. The space transportation is like other forms of transportation. The cost of doing it scales down rather rapidly as the volume of traffic scales up. So the great challenge we're facing right now in space transportation is we need more payloads. We need, we need more, more, more stuff, uh, breathing or not, flying up and down from space more often. Um, so the thing about space tourism uh, or personal space flight or call it what you will, is that uh, it's currently very expensive and that limits its volume. And in spite of that, there continues to be some level of interest. You know, people have actually flown now purely private missions to orbit. Um, the, you know, to get that cost down substantially, number one, more space traffic has to happen. But number two, they have to have a place to go because the, the, you know, it's, it's, it's an expensive way to fly to launch your, your hotel with you every time. Uh, uh, now, at this point, anything we say about that is speculative. Uh, the market hasn't sure. developed yet. Nobody really knows what the experiences are. Um, but I've always been rather skeptical that uh, a pure zero G habitat is going to be um, someplace you're going to want to stay long enough that enough of the, enough of the traffic is going to want to stay long enough to make the numbers all pencil uh, for all of the reasons we discussed. I mean, how, how long do you really want to go without a shower? Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it um, a fairly large number of people get space sick. Uh, we, we don't we don't have a really good way of testing for whether you're prone to that or not. Um, somewhat surprisingly, the short zero G flights that people can take are not a good predictor of whether they do or don't get space sick on orbit. Uh, so, uh, people have, have been very successful in learning how to control the nausea of that in short zero G flights with medication. Um, will that work on orbit? Good question. Uh, we don't know the answer to that yet. Uh, the, but I, I've always thought, you know, the ideal, um, habitat for the, a broader segment of the public would include both a zero G and a non zero G section, you know, have, have a despawn section so you can visit zero G for as long as it's fun. Uh, and, and then go back to your, your, uh, non zero G habitat. Uh, whether that be, you know, at a partial gravity or full gravity, we will know more about that after we have some idea about all the fundamental biomedical research questions and also questions yeah, like, sure. what do people like? Uh, you know, that's a question that isn't asked very often. Uh, the, the Russians did a very poorly instrumented, but it's the only experiment in town where they flew a biosatellite with a film recorder and they put a bunch of animals in a couple of meter, like a meter wide centrifuge. And the only data we really got is where do the animals like to hang out? 
you know, they could, because it was a disc shaped centrifuge, they can go wherever they want. Um, and they mostly hung out at about 0 0.4, 0 0.5 G. Uh, you know, is that telling us something? Maybe. Uh, <laughs> the, the other thing that we haven't talked about is, you know, there are the, the, the core competency that you guys have been working on in the near term is this trust building capability mm -hmm. because that underpins the ability to make large space structures. Um, and there's other things to do with large space structures than build variable gravity habitats. Uh, you know, yeah. there, are, there are big antennas we'd like to make for scientific or commercial purposes. There are big telescopes we'd like to make for scientific purposes. Um, you know, if, if at some point travel beyond low Earth orbit gets to be more economically important, um, there'll be big tank farms we want to make to accumulate mm -hmm. propellant and, and dispense it. Um, all of these things benefit from some capability of making large structures. And, you know, if you, if you go back to the question of what got me interested, uh, you know, variable gravity is very important. I'm very passionate about it. Um, but I think there's a decent chance you could make a perfectly good living just with the large space structures capability because other customers for that might arise. Right, right. There's going to be a need. I mean, it's, it's, it's a bit of a chicken and an egg in that you have to have that capability before people will really demand it, but yes. one can find the, a way the to The trust forming there. robot has been on the wish list since the mm -hmm. solar power satellite studies of the early 1970s. Uh, you know, it, it's, um, but as you say correctly, you know, nobody's going to plan their mission around it until it's a demonstrated capability. Uh, but right, once right. it is a demonstrated capability, we may find unanticipated uses for it. Absolutely. And similarly, until somebody can really offer a variable gravity facility in Earth orbit, you know, uh, you may not find that there are that many, that much demand or uses for it. But once it's there, you can see the, uh, uh, the use proliferate. I would think so. But, you know, I've been wrong before. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Jeff, for your time today. My pleasure. Yeah. So I hope you guys enjoyed those two interviews. Uh, thank you for listening. And of course, we really appreciate uh, Angie and, and Jeff for, for doing that with us. So uh, I hope you guys enjoyed and uh, we'll see you in two weeks. If you have suggestions for future discussion topics or anyone you'd like us to interview, uh, just shoot us an email, ourfutureinspace at orbitalassembly.com. And you can also reach out to us on Twitter and Facebook at Our Future Space and at Our Future in Space, respectively. Uh, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you guys soon. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.